What's going on, y'all? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. Time for another episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit in Pathfinder First Edition. Today, by request, poison. That thing you're not supposed to do because half the field is immune to it and it's bad. Let's make it good, shall we? If you're liking what you're seeing, remember to like, subscribe, and ding the bell. Remember that Patreon at any tier gets you a Google Sheet for this build, as well as all of our other first, second Starfinder 3.5 builds and a bunch of other cool stuff and can get any requests for if you'd like yours truly to make very corner case builds viable. You either die the hero making vital strike barbarians or you become the villain who does this to the front of the line, but for now, Okay, doke. So before we talk about the build itself, we must first talk about the owlbear in the room. In fact, so much of the field is immune to the thing that we want to do. Off the top of my head, constructs, the undead, elementals, the overwhelming majority of outsiders, most things adventure paths position as bosses, things that are poisonous are generally immune to poison in some fashion. Are there mechanical ways around this? Yes, absolutely. Are there mechanical ways around this in our class? Also, yes. Also, absolutely. However, if your players are showing up to the table with this build or a build similar, as a GM, it's your job to make sure that the build thrives. If they're putting a bunch of work into your table and you're making sure that work has an ability to shine rather than, oh, sorry, bud, all the zombies are immune to poison. It increases the investment of your table. People will want to come back more. You will have a better time. I've said all this a million times. Follow this card right up here. With that out of the way, Characters that want to deal damage with poison as a constant do suffer a couple of other problems which we fortunately are able to work around in class. And I suppose now is a great time to talk about what we're playing. Today we're playing 20 levels of Investigator, specifically the Toxin Codexer. Poison is expensive. In first edition Pathfinder, gold is often the direct translation between life or death in terms of your attack bonus, in terms of your important ability scores being up, your AC being up, so on and so forth. So oftentimes we don't have the money to shell out for that extra thing. The Toxic Codexer gets an ability called Synthetic Venom, which allows us to convert our extract slots into different short-lived poisons on a one-to-one -one basis. Specifically, at first level, we're looking at Arsenic, Giant Wasp Poison, and Medium Spider Venom. At second level, Black Adder Venom, Id Moss, and Striped Toadstool. At third level, Blue Winnis, Lich Dust, and Sassone Leaf Residue. At level 4, Dark Reaver Powder, Purple Worm Poison, and Third Eye. At 5th level, Deathblade Hemlock and Witch Hunter's Sword. And at level 6, Black Lotus Extract, Dragon Bile, and King's Sleep. GMs may add additional poisons to these selections. I will leave that up to your GM. I will also say there's a rogue talent that gets you a limited amount of drow poison. So, like, it seems reasonable. Work with your GM, get the flavorful thing, get the cool thing. I think we have enough in-house to build on here, so I'm not wildly suggesting you pick up anything. On top of this, the fort save DC of these poisons is 10, plus your int nod, plus the extract level of the poison. They become inert after one day, if not used. Once the poison is administered, the duration is normal, even if it's longer than a day. They can be applied to weapons only by the codexer, unless they have the infusion alchemist discovery, which gets around that other problem. There's no scaling DC for poisons. Now there is. Keep boosting your intelligence when you can, and you'll see your poison DCs boost as well. That solves a couple of the real big problems and ultimately is why I chose this class over like the Mantella Druid, the various rogues and alchemists that can do it, because we're looking at playing the long haul with this character. We are looking at, much like venomous creatures hunt, we want to strike them one or two times, let the dot tick to do its work, and then everybody else comes in to clean up the rest after. Wildly enough, we want to be strength and intelligence based in this build. There are all of three races in first edition Pathfinder with buffs to those ability scores, namely the Aphorite, the Rusher Damphir, I think I said all those words correctly, but the thing we'll be playing, the Karata Lashunta of all the things. 
If you're looking at the SRD, the Karata Lashunta in first edition Pathfinder is the male Lashunta. This has, of course, been retconned in Starfinder to remove the aspects of sexual dimorphism from the race. Presumably, when Lashunta are printed in second edition, it will follow suit, and thus we will assume we are following suit here. Y'all have been with me for a while. If you're watching the 1E videos, you know what we're about in this house. Anyway, not only does the Lashunta have the buff we want to the ability scores, it also gets the limited telepathy ability, which is really cool. The ability to mentally communicate with any creature within 30 feet with whom they share a language, really powerful. I got to play one of these for a very short time in Iron Gods. Gotta say, never underestimate the power of being able to speak to your party when you know the intelligent adversaries definitely cannot hear you. If you need to justify this choice to your GM, remember that the elves are from the homeworld of the Lashunta. Anywhere on Galarian, there is an Ayudara that leads to Castravel. It stands to reason a Lashunta could have gone through. It only takes two Lashunta coming through who love each other very much to make a Lashunta colony. Somewhere on Galarian, the settlement of Hajothakados in Numeria, the ability to cast interplanetary teleport, so on and so forth. It's easy enough to justify without not a lot of hoops jumped through if we're perfectly honest. We're looking at three traits today. Take whatever drawback is the most flavorful for you. Poisonous Slayer gives us a plus one. Trait bonus on attack rolls when you're wielding a weapon treated with poison. It requires us Worship Norgeber. Easy enough. Savannah Child, requiring we're from Katapesh. Remember, kids, the folks who run that big city in Katapesh of the same name as the state? Aliens. We have circled back to easy to justify. We'll choose handle animal for a plus one trait bonus on the skill and to make it a class skill for us. Then lastly, clever wordplay, choosing handle animal to use our intelligence for handle animal checks for the other way, we'll be planning on getting poisons. This is another scenario where there are truly a lot of ways to skin that owlbear, whether it come down to harvesting plants and doing alchemy things to make poisons out of them, getting the very rusty trap from the dungeon and now you have the tetanus poison. We will be cracking open Ultimate Wilderness for the thing we're looking for, the ability to milk animals for their venom. If you ask the rule book, it says that a creature can produce a number of doses of venom equal to its con mod each day with a minimum of one, which is a really weird distinction given that if the snake bites you one more time than its con modifier, like I'm sure you're still poisoned, right? But I guess I get it for balance. You have to make a handle animal check to get them to donate some of their venom. Bonus points if you have a wand of speak with animals, I suppose, but I'm not assuming that you will. And there is also a very wide swath of animals which you can choose from, such that we will not be talking about any of them in particular. It sort of depends on what lives near you in your campaign. For our ability score prioritization, we want to have the highest intelligence and strength possible. Intelligence being our poison save, DC, our extra spells, everything we do in class anyway, and strength being our method of delivery. I know it's weird, we'll get to it in a second. Dexterity, Wisdom, and Constitution as high as you can get without prioritizing because they're all three very important stats. Your saves and HP and initiative and stuff, your charisma, you can dump to the floor. Obviously, the higher the point by the better for everything you're playing. This build will do considerably better if you've rolled well for stats or are on like a 20 plus point by. For our feats at level one, I think I will always suggest this, no matter what kind of investigator we're building out the gate, extra inspiration. This gives us three extra uses per day of inspiration in our inspiration pool. To quickly circle back, the investigator uses their inspiration as a free action to add plus one d6 on any check. You can do it for knowledge, linguistics, or spellcraft without expending a use of inspiration, presuming you're trained, and spending two per allows you to add it to your saves or attack rolls, or basically every time you pick up 1d20. The more of this resource we can get, the better. At level three, with our base attack bonus having ticked up to plus one, we'll take the most controversial feat. In this entire build, there are gonna be a lot of poison stands from 1e who see me take this and get really mad. We're going to take exotic weapon proficiency, not for what you think, for the injection spear. This is why we're strength-based. We will be attacking them with the two-handed exotic weapon. Said exotic weapon has a reservoir which can hold up to five doses of a single fluid. A single dose is automatically injected when the spear hits a target. 
a non-proficient user can use it like a spear, but cannot trigger the injection. This is how we're going to cheat the poison action economy. If all of our level one giant wasp venoms just go into the spear at the beginning of the day, it's a very easy way to, okay, I hit you, poison triggers, make a fort save. And remember kids, in first edition, every time you are exposed to the same poison after the first, the save DC increases by two. We won't be able to poison as fast as like the rapid shot, many shotting archer or a two weapon fighting rogue, but we will be very efficient as the poisonous monsters often want to be. At level five, we'll take extra inspiration one more time. We will be taking this feat at level one, level five, level 15, level 17, you see the pattern here, right? Very good, get more of resource. Then at level seven, we'll take Dagger Mark Lore. Right on time for our third level extracts, we will choose Blue Winnis. When we deliver Blue Winnis, the number of saves needed to cure it increases by one. The DC to cure it with neutralized poison increases by five. So when the GM is breaking out healers to help against you, it hedges your bets a bit. Vital Strike comes next, you'll see why in just a second. And by just a second, I mean immediately, our next feat, Deep Toxin. When we use a poisoned weapon to make a vital strike, we increase the poison's duration by one frequency increment. So a dose of large scorpion venom would last for seven rounds instead of six. More importantly, this helps contact or injury poisons that would have a longer onset time not have to tick up. The poison's effect will take place immediately without onset time. The downfall of a lot of the very strong poisons, aside from ingested things, which we'll worry about later, is that oftentimes it will take a minute or so for the poison to fire on, and oftentimes in that minute, the rest of the party has murdered the thing we poisoned. This makes sure that doesn't happen. We'll next take Insightful Delivery, now that our studied strike is at plus 46. When we use a poisoned weapon to attempt an attack in conjunction with studied strike, the DC to resist said poison increased by half the number of our studied strike dice. To circle back really quickly, at level four, we gain the studied combat ability as a move action, we grant half our investigator level as an insight bonus on melee attack rolls and as a bonus on damage rolls. This lasts for a number of rounds equal to our int mod or until we deal studied strike damage, an additional 1d6 at fourth level, ticking up for every two levels thereafter. Really fits in with the vital strike vibes. Move action, study target, standard action, vital strike. Oops, our DC is too high. Then extra inspo twice, then improved initiative last, because if you got here, why the heck not? Synthetic Venom replaces our first investigator talent, so our first talent we will be choosing at fifth level, Lingering Venom, which makes all of our poisons require one additional save to cure. Next up, it's Sickening Offensive. When we deal damage to our studied target, the creature is sickened for a round. That being a minus two penalty on attack rolls, weapon damage rolls, saving throws. Ah, there's the good one for the poison, skill checks and ability checks. Essentially a minus two on all the things on already a debuff based character. See where I'm going? You're smart, of course you do. Quick study will allow us to use our studied combat ability as a swift action instead of a move action. The action economy does feel very good set up as is. However, sometimes we may also need to run up on them. Then combat inspiration. So when we're using inspiration on an attack roll or save, we expend one use of our inspiration instead of two. So we can have more in the pool for longer. Tenacious inspiration gives us advantage on the inspiration die rolling twice, taking the higher. Truly, I think at this point, all of my investigators take the same talents just because they're so good. Amazing inspiration gives us the roll of a D8, which we are now rolling twice, taking the higher instead of a D6. At 20th level, we roll 2d8 and add both dice to the result. Blinding strike next, slapping a fort save on our target of studied strike that might permanently blind them or dazzle them for 1d4 rounds or again, permanently blind them after you've dumped their con a little bit with poison. This is really scary. Then lastly, confusing strike to fort save or make something confused for 1d4 plus one rounds. For our key magic items, as many boro beads as you can get your hands on, for additional extracts per day, for additional poisons per day. Wowee, it's been so long since I've made a 1E video, I forgot to immediately plug the big six. Follow this card right up here because you know you need them. On top of that, Death's Will, a set of black leather fingerless gloves for ultimate edge, extend up to the middle of your forearm. Situated subtly in the underside of the glove is a hidden needle. Wearing this glove grants you a plus four competence bonus on sleight of hand checks to conceal poisons or toxins. Meh. As a swift action, the wearer can fire poison from the needle in the glove, 
delivering a stream of poison to a target within 30 feet, more importantly, as a ranged touch attack. Got a really high AC, just can't stick the dragon with your spear, stick him with this. The needle can hold a single dose of poison at any time, refilling it as a full round action, which provokes more options for making poisons go off. In another perfect combat turn, we may be move action, study, standard action, vital strike, then they save, then swift action, hit them with the same poison again. At a very cheap 3000 gold next, the Poison Vial of Distance is a magic vial that allows the application of poisons at a range of up to 30 feet. You must supply the poison, easy enough, it must be a contact or big one here, ingested poison. The user adds the poison to the vial, shakes it in the direction of the item or creature they wish to affect, and then make a ranged touch attack with a plus four circumstance because you're using the magic item. If the attack is successful, the poison is successfully delivered to the object or creature intended. It can be hard to stick ingested poison without a lot of sneaking and poisoning their food and such. This is a way to do it, though. Presumably the sneaking would still need to happen and you would still need a little bit of time for that initial save to tick up. Though if I'm honest, I don't hate that. In first edition Pathfinder, there's almost always that point in time where the party is casting their buff spells. During that rotation, this character could be just as easily up forward under say like greater invisibility, throwing poisons around whether they take a minute to activate or activate immediately. So as the party is buffing, you are debuffing, then everybody else comes through the door, initiative is rolled, but you've already won the encounter. That's you. That's gross. I like that. At a plus one bonus, the virulent enchantment on our spear increases the saving throw of DCs from any poisons applied to the virulent weapon by a number equal to the weapon's enhancement bonus. The duration of said poison increases by a number of rounds also equal to the enhancement bonus, which is gnarly. A casual plus five to both at the end of the game, or even a plus two in the mid game is real, real good. The toxic enchantment increases the save DC of the poison by plus two. In addition, each time such a weapon strikes a target, there is a 25% chance the poison dose is not expended in the attack and can be used to make an additional attack. A single dose of poison can be preserved by this property only once, but when there's five in the spear and there's a 25% chance that those poisons are going to be preserved, someone do the math in the comments, it makes the poison last longer, more longer, more good. Easy peasy, right? Now for the one everyone is screaming at me about, the most honorable list of mentions that any video of mine has ever had. Yes, we are choosing the injection spear because I like it more in the long term, I also feel like between weapon enchantments, between feats, between buffing our own intelligence scores, we have enough ways to modify the save DCs of our poisons that we do not need, in fact, a Callistrian Kiss. A plus one heart seeker elven curve blade with three slots built into it to store doses of poison. Adding or removing the dose from the blade is a swift action, which requires a free hand. Any creature struck by the Callistrian Kiss takes a minus four untyped penalty on any save against the poison applied to the weapon. The frequency increases by two. Attempts to cure the poison target with a skill or magic item take a minus four. This is really good. Do not get me wrong. In Magic the Gathering terms, I also feel like this weapon is incredibly win more. I think if you've increased your DC high enough, you do not need to also debuff them. And I value the Injection Spear's utility more so than I value this huge debuff. With that said, if you're playing on super mega extra hard mode and you know DCs are going to be high, I feel different. In the average first edition adventure path, I just, I think we cross the line from optimization to overtuning, which can often cause GMs to have to overtune in response and it gets unfun for everyone. Now, before we burn out for the day, let's talk about some actual poisons that we get that are really cool. Like I said, there's gonna be a lot of poisons today that we just don't straight up talk about. I can't believe I'm making a video about how to make a poisoner without including drow poison. Someone's mad about it in the comments, I'm sure. But I think we have enough in-house and since we can make the things that we have in-house with our extract slots, it just feels better to build off of those. Though, as a general rule, aside from poisons that will just straight do damage, kill someone, make them unconscious, fall asleep, or paralyzed, thus putting them in coup de gras range, generally speaking, you are going to want to choose poisons that target the dexterity or constitution of the foe. A decreased dexterity means a lower armor class, a decreased constitution means 
lower HP. Remember that ability damage has to tick down in increments of two to bump down the stat. Odd numbers don't matter as much. It's not ability drain. Strength poisons could also be fun, but I'm not going to tell you to have your GM enforce encumbrance rules, but you could. In a world where there's a very good auto calcing Pathfinder first edition sheet, then hell yeah, sounds great. Giant wasp poison. Once around for six rounds with one save to cure inflicting 1d2 points of dex damage. If you were to buy this or make friends with a giant wasp, its save would be 18. Remember that we're tracking off our essentially spell save DC. This isn't going to win any battles or be anything you want to write home about, but if you knock someone's dex down by one or two, it's certainly nothing to shake an injection spear out because it makes it easier for everyone else to stick hits. If they are trying to shoot you, if they are trying to range touch attack you, if they are using dragon in the room and their light weapon is swinging with dexterity to attack and damage, follow this card right up here. The value is also baked in. It's really the only first level poison we're going to talk about at level two, Black Adder Venom. A similar duration, a higher DC than the actual animal for 1d2 con can get very scary very quickly. Stick a couple of these and it becomes easier to stick more or different poisons. You are eventually hurting the hit points of the foe, which makes them die faster, which is ultimately what we want. But again, I think the scariest of them, I think most of our third level extract slots go to Blue Winnis. This has been eroded from the core rulebook. It used to hit their constitution and their wisdom. The ultimate equipment errata only does one con damage. Its frequency is once per round for two rounds, which is extended by some of our class features and multiple doses. The secondary effect renders the foe unconscious for 1d3 hours. An unconscious opponent is an opponent that you or your friends can coup de gras, an automatic critical hit which forces a fortitude save or they die. After the battle is ended, removing a foe from the combat is often the strongest thing to do, even if they're not outright dead. Bonus points if you're trying to drag someone back for interrogation after, this'll do it. Or, God, should someone, what has a bad fort save? The rogue, let's say. Say that the rogue gets dominated, hit them with their own blue winners, they go unconscious, therefore they don't sneak attack the party to death. It's a win-win. Sison leaf residue is our first poison, a contact poison with an onset time of one minute. Remember, our vital strike shenanigans make this happen immediately. Its initial effect, a casual 2d12 points of just straight physical hit point damage. Don't call us the super rogue. Then its secondary effect, one con damage, which continues ticking after they've been beat up by you, your friends, and the primary effect. To say nothing of the primary effect of several doses of this, it's solid. Third eye is a weird choice. There are a lot of poisons out there that will inflict wisdom damage. You may want more of these if you have lots of party members who are casting spells that require will saves. Its effect is 1d3 wisdom damage. Each time the victim takes wisdom damage, it must succeed at a dc17 will save. Presumably this save is modified also, as well as the fortitude save from it being a thing that you made, given that they're the same number, that makes sense to me, or become confused for that round. So top of the round, make a will save. You failed this round, you're confused. It's probably my favorite debuff in first edition Pathfinder. Just casually make the big scary thing beat up on its friends instead of you. Deathblade, once a round for six rounds, 1d3 con. It's our bigger black adder venom. Printed in Ultimate Wilderness, the mighty Witch Hunter's Sword, our first ingested poison, the one we're putting in our shaky poppy bottle, and a really good poison in our back pocket versus casters. Its effect is one intelligence, wisdom, and charisma damage. As long as the poison persists, the victim takes a minus five penalty on concentration checks and must roll concentration checks at DC 20, plus double the spell's level, so like bigger concentration, essentially, to cast spells or use spell-like abilities with two saves to cure, presumably at like a wizard or something that won't immediately snap their fingers and heal themselves to circle back to the thesis statement, taking someone out of the fight, potentially before the fight has even begun. Then lastly, our trump card, our big scariest thing in the pocket, Black Lotus Extract for 1d6 con damage. That's an average of seven constitution lost from two failed saves. Now, lastly, in our very old optimized party, follow this card right up here. I hesitate to put this in the optimized party just because I know in first edition Pathfinder, there's so much scarier stuff you can do. 
With that in mind, we kind of feel like a weird hybrid between our control builds and a Punisher. Long Arm is an extract on our extract list, Greater Invisibility is as well. We theoretically could have a big threat range and at least one attack of opportunity in a round delivered to someone who then is suffering a debuff. Is it a big come and get me barbarian with combat patrol? No. Is it your average slumber witch? No. But it can fill kind of sort of both niches while having a lot of out of combat utility that neither class truly can as only the investigator can. Rolling very high knowledge checks very early in the game answers a lot of questions and a lot of APs, trust me, I've read them, that like, here's the DC, if the party hits this, they know such and such that it would be like super impossible for anyone to know until this character showed up, right? Investigators are one of my favorite classes in First Edition Pathfinder because they're so jack of all trades, master of most, and this one helps the foes become a, a master of none as their stats are nuked and they're dead on the floor. But that's all the time I have for today. What do y'all think? Those of us who are still playing First Edition Pathfinder, have we rolled up the Toxin Codexer? If so, how did it work for you? What's your favorite poison that's not on this extract list that you would argue for? Throw it down in the comments. There are a copious amount of first edition requests on the list at this point. The dice are making them come up much more often than others because they kind of just outnumber the 2v ones at this point. So you're probably going to see a lot of 1e in this house for a little while. Till then, y'all, we'll see you next time.